Good afternoon and welcome to our session on bursting bubbles. We learned from Francis in the opening today that there is an ever need for collaboration in the industry. And we are going to try and set the tone for radical collaboration and bursting bubbles. And to start off our session, we would appreciate your attention for our introductory film. It's very hot. It's very humid. I'm 2,500 meters up in the Volcano National Park in Rwanda. I'm sweating, my legs are aching, and a gorilla has just changed the way I think. Actually, not the gorilla itself, but the story of how these gorillas have survived and thrived in Rwanda has just opened my mind to the idea of radical collaboration. Let me explain. Before 2004, the gorilla population in the park was being devastated by poaching. Poachers went largely unchecked and unpunished across this and the neighboring parks in Uganda and the DRC. They were desperate and increasingly dangerous, and conservationists were at a loss as to how to stem the tide of body parts and live animals being taken from the park. Then a young Rwandan intern named Edwin Sabuhoro bravely went undercover to rescue a baby gorilla. The poachers had killed several adults and were attempting to sell the baby on the black market. The sting operation saved the baby and the two young poachers were caught and sentenced to life in prison. Of course, Edwin was happy for the rescue, but he also felt very sad that the two young men, not that different from him in many ways, had become so desperate that they'd turned to poaching and had now ruined their lives. He wanted to understand why they had made those choices, so he visited with their families who lived just outside the park. One of the men's fathers told him plainly, if you were starving and couldn't feed your family, wouldn't you do something desperate to survive? Spurred by this comment, Edwin investigated deeper into the communities living on the park boundary. What he discovered in talking and listening to them was that the people resented the existence of the park. They actually suffered because of their proximity to the park. Their crops and homesteads were threatened by marauding animals, and they were prevented from accessing the park for food, wood and water. They certainly did not see the park as an asset, and saw almost no reason to conserve its rich ecology. Edwin's conversations with the communities helped him understand that if the basic needs of the people around the park were not being met, and if they were not given reasons to value the park and its resources, then the gorillas in the park itself would inevitably disappear. He realized that the park could only be saved if a direct relationship was created between the people living outside of it and the resources, animals, plants, and other assets contained inside its boundaries. What was needed was a radical collaboration. So he started a company called Rwanda Eco Tours, which shares its profits from guiding and hosting tourists with the communities around the park. He opened a cultural village, staffed by ex-poachers, where tourists could engage with Rwandan food, music and dance. He encouraged young villagers to become guides and porters and rangers, earning dollars directly from tourists in the park. The government of Rwanda and other operators saw the value of the model and aligned their practices so that the park now effectively disperses more than 600,000 US dollars a year to community projects. Schools, health facilities, water storage, roads, a radical amount of positivity injected into the community through this collaboration. And now the park is treasured by all as an invaluable partner for development and growth. Edwin hopes now that this approach can be applied in neighboring DRC and Uganda, where although the costs of seeing the gorillas are significantly less than in Rwanda, the problem of desperate, dangerous poachers and the disenfranchised communities that create them still persists. In Rwanda, there have been no gorillas poached since 2005. The poachers have become the protectors. And that brings me back to my gorilla-sized, mind-shifting moment. As I sat watching the real-life result of Edwin Sabuhoro's transformative thinking, I realized that we in global mobility need to challenge ourselves to consider not just collaboration as we're used to, but a radical collaboration across our experience. Radical collaboration not as a quick fix, but as a journey we take as partners. Radical collaboration that we engage in as a business, to evolve, to grow, and to survive. Further to the film, radical collaboration, I think we would really appreciate a little more of a definition on it. So, Anna, tell us why we brought it to the table and what radical collaboration is. Thanks, Sophie. 
So we thought we'd start today's session with the video of the gorillas in Uganda because it was a situation that was seemingly really intractable, full of conflict and adversarial relationships and with really devastating consequences. And the solutions that had been proposed prior to this were very much band-aid solutions because no one was really getting to the root cause of why the people were killing the gorillas. And when they actually started listening to all of the different stakeholders involved, they could actually get to the bottom of it and then come up with a solution that would work for all so everybody could work together and, and ultimately survive and thrive. Now, today we have a pretty diverse panel. We have RMCs, corporate housing, RMCs, household goods, and DSP. I'm not sure if that's ever been done before at Euro, but here we all are. And I very much believe that ultimately we are all partners servicing two clients. We have the corporate client and we have the assignees that we're moving, the employees that are moving for work. And we're all in the middle and we're like an ecosystem. And for that ecosystem to be healthy, we all independently need to be healthy, but also to partner and work together so we can all rise up and thrive. Now, it's quite obvious that we're facing quite a lot of challenges um, at the moment, both internal within our industry, but also external COVID, uh, socio-political issues, social justice issues, um, climate change, etc. And so now it's really incumbent on all of us to um, start taking action and working together to try and you know, um, come up with some solutions to some of this. It's, it's not really, now is not the time where we just sit back and wait for governments to solve it all for us. So with collaboration, you can improve um, innovation, you can create value, um, agility, productivity, you can improve efficiency. And the concept of kind of radical collaboration is about the fact that you are um, accepting that the different people come to the table with different agendas and that's okay because you're creating a really trusting environment. I think we've come a long way and in a way COVID definitely helped because we all started to communicate much more and support each other that this industry is really well known for and great for. And it's no longer the case that, oh my God, I can't sit in the same room as that person, oh God. It's, we've come a long way, but I do think that we need to not be um, complacent and not go back to our old ways so that we can recognize that um, what are we going to do about these challenges that we're facing at the moment? And together we can actually come to some sort of really innovative, creative solutions, but we can't, can't do it alone. Thank you, Anna. Daniel, what opportunities do you think we have to foster radical collaboration across sectors in our industry? Yeah, so there's definitely a few. Um, I would say on the backdrop of the last couple of years, there's definitely an opportunity to review um, how we do things. There's many programs that may not be fit for purpose, and uh, our clients are picking up on it. Um, so there's definitely um, a bigger focus from our side to look at how we do things. Um, for example, in a destination service, uh, service space, we have to look at the relocation milestone one by one, uh, look at the touch points, uh, understand where um, the moments that matter are monitored very closely. Uh, this is what creates the value, and we are being asked um, day in, day out, where is the value, what value do you present uh, to us uh, as the relocation management company, which we pass this question on to our suppliers and ask the same, um, where do you add the value in the process? Um, another opportunity I see, and it's been out there for quite some time, is uh, promoting our suppliers um, for our clients. There's so much work that goes into uh, servicing our accounts and helping the assignees. Um, we still struggle um, as a company or maybe as an industry to promote what our suppliers do. Um, so I definitely see a great opportunity um, with that. Um, advocating on behalf of our suppliers, uh, it's very critical as well, especially um, I call them the smaller guys. It's easier to speak to uh, uh, large companies with well-developed systems and infrastructure. But um, when, you, when you have a need in a remote location, when you have a need in a tertiary city, um, you have to lean on small supplier. And these guys many times need help. Um, I had a good conversation today as an example 
around invoicing. So our clients impose uh, financial terms onto us, knowing, for example, in some markets, the standard would be 30 days uh, of payments. It would be very, very difficult for the supplier to commit to, let's say, 60 or 90 days. So as the relocation management company, and I hope I speak for all, uh, we should be pushing back on our clients and explaining um, what sort of adverse effect this would have um, on the supplier and their payroll and ability to actually um, fund service for the employees. Um, something that's been on my wish list for quite some time um, is actually involving suppliers uh, during the implementation process. Uh, easier said than done, um, but uh, we're slowly getting there. And there's tremendous opportunity to actually fine-tune the delivery uh, at that stage, as opposed to rush or sprint towards the go-live date line and be happy that we made it on time, uh, knowing that the actual service um, may not be 100% where it needs to be. So I think it's a great opportunity uh, to maybe slow down a bit, um, give a chance for suppliers to come to the table um, with the ideas, recommendations, um, course correct, you know, in early stages, and then be able to start 100% um, with the service. Thank you, Daniel. Renee, maybe you have a couple points to add to that? Um, well, certainly on the payment terms, I do. <laughs> but I just think, I mean, you know, I'm a small DSP sitting in South Africa, Cape Town, and we have had to push back a lot on payment terms purely because we actually pay our consultants and we landed up funding um, basically our clients and we had to stop that because I couldn't no longer look at my consultants in the eye and say to them, I'm sorry, there's delayed payment. So we had to pay on time and so we pushed up the, so up the supply chain and requested the same of our clients. So we've actually got all our clients now paying in 30 days. So it's a good point. It's a very good point. I think it's also important to note that we're starting the discussion on radical collaboration, but it's actually already being done. We have a prime example in the UK at the moment where there's been a group of actually competitors that have come together under the umbrella of the ARP to lobby together for recognition. So it's not actually something that we can't do. It's something that in a lot of situations we probably have made the choice to avoid or not do. Um, along with that, we also need to understand that businesses must move beyond what we would consider an exploitive mindset. It's not really a nice to have, it's a must have. So, Joe, maybe you could tell us to what extent you fostered a culture of fairness and inclusivity in your business. Absolutely. Um, first and foremost, um, I would like to say that. A culture of fairness in any organization, I think, needs to be the base level for any business. And um, when we started our business in 2019, so we're quite a young company. We started just post-COVID. Um, but when we started our company, one of the most important things for us was to recruit well and also to support women returners in the workplace. So um, we... we developed our, our team and um, we had 80% female leadership, which was absolutely fantastic for us. And we continue to have 80% um, leadership now that we've um, gone from five people up to 25 people in two and a half years. So that's, we're really happy about that. But one of the most important things that I experienced, and I'm sure there might be some other um, women-owned businesses in the room, um, but when I started the business, I um, was recommended actually by a very large corporate to um, start a certification for a women-owned business in order to be able to speak to corporates um, that maybe I wouldn't be able to get to the table at if I wasn't a certified supplier as a small startup. So when we started women-owned, um, I went through the certification process. The incredible question that they asked me after they'd awarded me, and literally they gave me the award and then said, what are you going to do with this? And for me, it was really important because it took me about 20 seconds to realize that this was a gift that I'd been given. I am a female. Um, I'm lucky enough to be born a female, so therefore I've been given a gift um, in this current climate to um, potentially sit at tables that I maybe wouldn't, as a startup, be given the opportunity to sit at. So I said, I want to pay it forward 
it's really important for me to pay this forward to our industry and to our supply chain. So we set up a program called ATCAP Your Welcome. And this is led actually by our supply director, um, Claire, who's in the room. And um, when, we, when we started the ATCAP Your Welcome, what it really meant was that Claire's job was going to be slightly harder than it was originally, which is just bringing in loads of supply, great big suppliers, brilliant brands that have maybe got 90,000 units versus bringing brands in, as you've said, Daniel, with maybe five units in the tertiary location. So it's managed by a, either a minority or a small business. So we started that process of having to have that equality of if you do a meeting with or you have a meeting with a supplier that's a large brand, you have to equalize that with a meeting with a smaller supplier. So that allows other smaller suppliers to come to our table. Now those meetings can take double, triple the time of a meeting to bring on 90,000 units because those professional suppliers know how to provide that, but the smaller suppliers maybe don't know how to do it. So as you say, it's about bringing on and training those people to come through with us. But what's also important is that we built our systems to be able to measure our diversity. So we can now provide already um, data back to our corporate buyers or to our RMCs or TMCs to explain exactly where they're spending their pounds, dollars, euros, and whether they're using uh, a diverse supply chain. So that was the kind of areas that was really, really important for us. But then we realized actually it goes so much further. At Cup Your Welcome has got a massive lifespan now for us. It's now in our recruitment. So when we recruit, we make sure that we make people welcome. It doesn't matter if you've got a disability. It doesn't matter if you suffer from OCD or ADHD. We will work around you. We just need to know how to do it. You work with us. And only last week, I had an amazing experience. I was contacted by a wonderful lady with a two-year-old child. Um, and she said, I'd love to come and work for CAP. So I did the interview. This is an entry-level position, but we still, I'm still involved in the entry-level because we're small enough too, which is fantastic. But when I actually sat with her on the screen, I had a feeling her two-year-old child, child was in the room. And um, she was saying that she wanted to come and work for us. And I had to ask the question, you've got a two-year-old, have you got childcare? And she said, uh, no. And I said, okay, when could you start? So she said, Monday. And I said, you've got no childcare. So she said, no, but I can get it, but not for the first month. And I was like, wow, okay. So then suddenly she started to get emotional and I said, right, okay, let's stop here. If I offer you three months childcare, would that make it easier for you? Because as she explained to me, if I've got no job, I can't get childcare. And if I've got childcare, I can't pay for it. So it was a, she was in a catch-22, there was no way she was going to be able to be employed. So offering her three months, I mean, she broke down on the phone, I broke down on the phone, it was an emotional experience, but it was incredible that we were able to actually bring somebody on that actually couldn't get started in work because of her childcare issues. So it's about being diverse, being inclusive, and that's where the fairness comes from our perspective. It's super important for us. And as I've said, our leadership, 80, so 80% 80 of our team are, um, are females, but all of them are female returners, and 50% of that leadership team are looking after children under 10. So we have to have a hugely collaborative environment where people are supported. And as far as our global talent is concerned, what's absolutely incredible is that we've realized we're a 24-hour business, so if you need to do things with your children, if you need time off, we're happy for you to catch up. So that's the most important thing for us, really, in, in our business, and which really does fall into fairness, is making sure that we look at every single area and ensure we're being fair, equitable, that we provide support to everybody inside our team. It doesn't matter whether you're male, female, if you've got a disability or not, or wherever you are, wherever you are in the world, we just want to make sure that at CAP you're welcome. So it's worked from supply, and now it's through our recruitment, and it runs through our DNA. Thanks, Joe. So we've just heard the word relationship from Joe a couple of times, and I'm just going to go from relationship to partnership and direct a question at Ibru. 
Um, when we consider bursting bubbles and building bridges, what collective, I was going to say problems, but let's just call it challenges, um, and opportunities do you see in your sector to foster healthy partnerships? Uh, first of all, I'm a mover by heart. <laughs> And uh, I was... That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to come there. And uh, I was introduced to the relocation industry in the late 90s. Uh, my, I mean, my first uh, conferences that I attended for many years before get to know Yura uh, was FIDI and IAM. So it was packed with movers. Uh, when I first started to join Yura conferences, I noticed that uh, how many more women involved in the relocation industry compared to household goods moving, which was a perfect surprise for me. Uh, but at the same time, I realized that movers were not really liked uh, within the relocation industry. Uh, and uh, at one stage, I, I realized that I should keep myself quiet, not mention my mover site, which, which wasn't easy. But now today, we are all uh, seeing that we are all serving to the same, same very same customers. We all go through the same challenges. And uh, we need to start from somewhere to communicate with each other. And in fact, uh, we are seeing more and more movers involved in the relocation industry offering DSP services. And it's also the other way around because we have to diversify our businesses for the continuity, long continuity of it. And, uh, I believe that, uh, especially amongst the moving industry, as well as the whole stakeholders in the mobility uh, hall, we need to share uh, more with, with each other. And it starts with communication. Uh, and I'm sure when we start communicating more, we will find a lot that we can collaborate with each other. Yeah. Thank you. We're going to stay on relationships. I understand that Grable is an RMC that has a high focus on relationships and partnerships. So, Kathy, could you explain how you actually practice and live that at Grable, especially also when making purchasing decisions? Sure. So, I think one of the things that we've, it's, you know, it's been a, a long road and we've changed and there's a lot of faces in this room that were part of that change. It starts with procurement, there's a foundation you have to build. And it starts with making sure that we have the right people with the capabilities and, and, and the abilities and the, and the desire, right, to make the changes that we need to make to support our clients and, our, and each other. And so when we started to look at this, we created a new foundation at Grable over the last few years, and it really starts with a, a very procurement-minded start, but it ends with partnership. And, and, and how you get from A to Z is you make sure that you've got the right people that are aligned with the same you know, mindset around um, you know, social responsibilities, um, capabilities, desire to elevate the client experience um, with always a focus, you know, on DE&I as well. And what we've done is we've taken what used to be those in-the-box bids that every one of us has, has sat and gone through and thought, this was a copy-paste question. They didn't even name us the right provider, you know, and we all have experienced those. And we said, no, we've got to customize this to make it fit for Grable, because what comes from that procurement foundation is great partnerships. And then once we get to that partnership, what do we do with it? And that's where I think with it's evolving. It's evolving with the help of our, our fantastic partners, our leadership. And what we're doing is doing more work towards alignment you know, when we, get a, when we get a bid in the door, we've got this great network of partners now. So we've taken this procurement base, we've created these great partnerships, and now we have this wonderful, wonderful supplier network. Um, but then what do we do? We get a bid in the door, and then how does that apply from a buying standpoint? And it's really about aligning partners. It's giving opportunities to more than one partner. 
It's collaborating and oftentimes it's breaking down the barriers from being, a, there's a, get rid of the competitive edge and, and make it more about united front to serve the client. And that's, that's what we're doing and we're, we're trying. We're not great yet, but we're, we're good and we're getting better and we're learning. But our clients are looking for so many things and we're all navigating through some new stuff right now. And the one thing that came out of this is all the amazing things that our partners have done through COVID, um, through the, the crisis more recently. And these are the people that we've aligned with and we're so proud of. And that's why it just ignites us and, and it becomes very synergistic to make sure that we continue to support our network through that buying phase. And that's, uh, that's kind of what we're doing. We still have some stuff to learn, but we're, we're getting there. We grow and we learn. <laughs> we understand that for radical collaboration, there is a certain amount of willingness and understanding that needs to be had. Renee, could you give us some insights on that? Yep, and I guess it's um, what we're sharing here today really is some of our insights, some of uh, practical applications. But I guess for those of you who are in the room, and, and I will put the recording so those who weren't could watch it again, but essentially going to Rwanda to see the gorillas is almost three times more expensive than going to Uganda. And the reason is because Rwanda is investing back into their communities, so it is more expensive. They're giving value back to their own community, and by this they can lift up. So essentially, I think there are three elements on how we can, I guess, set the environment for radical collaboration. The first being value. If we, in our own businesses, demonstrate value and use that as our guiding principle, um, and market ourselves carefully on that principle rather than price and not enter price wars because I believe value will be able to serve our people and planet. However, if we go into a price war, we land up not serving our people and planet. And that is, for me, key in terms of setting the stage for radical collaboration. Um, the second thing is willingness. Um, to get around the table, it's not necessarily to come up with a business concept to make some money. It's actually pulling people together from diverse backgrounds and not just perhaps gender, also size of companies, uh, continents they represent, uh, industry sectors, um, to bring them together and have a willingness to open up hearts, minds, um, to be able to talk about how to solve problems. I think in our industry sector, we have a lot of problems. I feel like we're putting a lot of plasters on problems. I don't think we've actually uncovered what the problems are and how we can best resolve them because we do function um, pretty much in our silos. So radical collaboration you know, requests us to kind of work more extensively with the silos together. And then finally, I think time. Um, so, you know, dedicating time, as I say, it's not necessarily a business concept that's going to generate immediate income or return on investment. Um, we recently ran a temporary housing sustainability workshop and actually it was incredible because it was competitors all coming together to solve a problem. And they all gave up their time to come round a table and discuss how they can together resolve a big question like sustainability. So, yeah, I think those are the three um, big blocks to be able to set the stage for starting to discuss radical collaboration. You have 20 I think you seconds. you said something important, Rana. It's uh, giving me the time piece that stuck with me. Um, it's um, in, a, in a supply chain, obviously, and I try and focus as well to be a bit more consultative to the smaller players in the market. Uh, these are the guys that are probably not sitting in those chairs right now <laughs> because they can't afford it. Uh, these are the guys that are also probably daunted by um, massive compliance paperwork we send across to them. Um, we do it obviously for reason, but uh, we do have a massive questionnaire, a risk uh, assessment questionnaire with 155 questions across 20 various categories, which is a monumental task for some smaller uh, company to respond to. So giving time and uh, spending time, maybe a bit of a consultation with the company, 
uh, bring them up to the speed on uh, certain areas and where they need to improve uh, if they want to get a shot to be working with a, a relocation management company is important. So uh, I did that a few times uh, in my career. Um, still happy to do it, uh, to raise the smaller players. Um, and these are the guys that are very grateful. They'll do, they'll do anything, um, which uh, is when we need it. You know, we can, you can make a phone call and get that service um, almost immediately. Amazing. Thanks, Daniel. So can I, yeah, I, I, from, from our perspective as well, as a small supplier, <laughs> we, we actually really appreciate that. And I think one of the important things as well is that we like to pay our suppliers really fast if we can possibly do that. And I think that the challenge is, is that so many secondary and tertiary locations require upfront payments. And if we want to compete on that level playing field, um, we have to pay the upfront payments. And I think just always ensuring that you are paying at least at 30 days, maybe some 45, some 60. But if, we, if so long as we get that payment on time and actually not get questions the day before the invoice is due, I think it's a really good help for us small suppliers, definitely. Thank you. Sorry, I'm not going to give Daniel the time to answer that. Let me find. Kathy, when we look at a regenerative business approach, where do you think Grable's strengths and maybe areas of improvement lie? Hmm. Well, I, I will tell you, our focus this year at Grable is the year of empowerment, and that's a big word. And what it really means is, what can we do? To, what tools can we provide our partners and our clients to be successful? Right now, everybody is still trying to figure out how to navigate this, as you know, we've talked about. And what we're trying to do, I guess, is to say, you know, what do you need from us? We're empowering you to be innovative, uh, to think outside the box, do the things that you believe you need in your region to serve those clients. And we're, we're here to help. Um, so from that perspective, we're kind of giving this opportunity to, to, you know, what you think we need, bring to the table, let's do it. Where we could be better, and, and we know that, and we're working on it, is sharing in the information that our partners need to be better. Mm -hmm. And that is get them in front of the clients and let them talk to the clients and really get a sense of what they want. Sometimes the translation is the biggest thing that creates the damage. What we heard, what our account manager may have heard, and then what our partner heard, right? And, and they're the ones that have to deliver it. They're the extension of us. And so we have to figure out how to be better at communicating and how, better at translating. So that's a big part of it. And I think the other part that we need to do is it's okay to be transparent, right? It's okay to talk about, yeah, you've been working with this client for a long time. Their volume's pulling back right now. But you know what? That's how our partners adapt from headcount to, you know, being able to forecast their business. Mm -hmm. So it's layers and layers of things that we're learning on how to be better. And we've created platforms, and we've had them for a long time through our quarterly, you know, scorecard reviews and monthly calls with our partners. But what we finally did, and this was something that we have not done before, and I'm super excited about it, is our account managers were each asked a few months ago to go back to the client and say, let's talk more about what you're thinking about doing next. What does that look like? And it was aggregated into this amazing document and overwhelming to read because you've, there's lots and lots of information in there that was, you know, very eye-opening. But now we have this fantastic tool that when we sit down with our partners in our monthly meetings, we can say, hey, let's take a look at that client. Let's take a look at the regions, the ones that you serve, and, and sharing that information that I think for a long time you, you weren't transparent about, and now we are. So we've got some ways to go, but I think we finally have an understanding through, from our account managers. They know the importance of our partners. We educate them every day on all the things that our partners do. Our, our consultants, would, they wouldn't know what to do without you, and, and we know that. So we, we, we have all these areas where 
we know that there's this value to our partners. The problem is we don't share it enough and we don't convey that enough. And so I think one of the things at Grable this year, part of that empowerment is the communication and transparency. And so it's, you know, sometimes it's, it's hard for people to swallow a lot of that information, but it's human. And, and it's how we're going to get better and, and, and grow together. So I would say that's probably our area of most improvement needed. Thank you. I really appreciate the fact that we're having such an open discussion here. I think this is great. Um, Joe, in corporate housing, how do you feel that there has been collaboration in, for example, solving blockages? Yeah, firstly, I just want to say I 100% agree with you. Uh, I think from, from our perspective, we have to trust our supply chain because our supply chain look after the guests. So you're trusting them with the most important commodity, but not with the information sometimes to actually really look after that, com that commodity, that person, as well as you possibly can. So I think actually trust and transparency is absolutely, it's a non-negotiable really if you want a really smooth stay. And the other thing is I've always found if you trust you actually get trust back. And, and when they hear about information, they actually call us and say, by the way, there's a potential another project. These guys are going on somewhere else. You might want to get in, in front of them. So I think if you've got the two-way relationship and conversations, it always works. So I uh, 100% agree with you. Back to corporate housing. Um, so what we're trying to do is this is a really important area for us now, especially over the next 18 months, two years. We've got an opportunity like we've never had it before. We're all on a sustainability journey. We're all trying to find our way. We've got a chance to work collaboratively because I know that we can disrupt and mess up the whole supply chain so easily if all of us agents, all of us service department booking agents, go and do our own thing. So if, we're, if I send out from CAP, if Silverdor sends out from Silverdor, Situ sends out from Situ, Every agency actually sends out their own measurement for sustainability, carbon emission measurements. The supply chain is literally going to go into a meltdown because if they've got to answer my 80 questions in a certain way and then someone else's that's a slightly different measurement or a slightly different focus, they are literally going to go into a meltdown. So we literally are going to be the receivers of information. So it's a little bit easier for us, but our supply chain is definitely going to suffer. So we've been speaking with the leadership of the, the global agents to make sure that we actually sit down over the next... We we're going to try and do it here, but actually all of our diaries got full too quickly. But get together over the next three, three months to start working regeneratively together to see if we can be altruistic, see if we can leave our egos at the door. That's going to be the hardest thing for all of us, I promise you. We've all got an ego. We're all trying to do it our own way. We're all trying to shine. But sustainability isn't actually about shining, it's actually about being. So if we can be the best versions of ourselves, come to the table, sit and actually work out how we can do this collaboratively, to do it in partnership with each other, and just imagine us then being able to pass up to every RMC the same information for the same provider. Because otherwise, you're going to get entirely different numbers because my calculator might work different to, to Silverdoors, to Situs, to everyone else's. So my goal, and it's a personal goal of mine, and it's a bit of a bugbear, is that if we can come to the table and, and no one own it, we own, all own it, it's not a cap table, it's not a silver door table, it's actually an agency table, we could actually help maybe the RMCs to come together so that they do that with us. They actually do the same measurement with us. But I think it starts with us because we're lower down the supply chain. We are the second tier. And then there's actually a third tier. So if we can do that right, if we can actually come together, I think that would be absolutely incredible. But it is altruistic behaviour. It's non-competitive. I'm one of the most competitive people in the room, so that's going to be challenging for me. But if I can do it, I'm hoping that all of my comrades can do it as well, because that's going to be important. But I think it's our future success that we will measure it's not going to happen to begin with, and everyone's going to want their questions. But if we can actually try and at least find 80% that actually matches, and then 20% for what we discussed this morning, the niche questions that you maybe want to be your differentiators, that's absolutely fantastic. But let's give our supply chain a break. Let's allow them to be brilliant. Good 
I may add, yes. so Rene also knows, it's a perfect initiative what you just uh, shared. Recently, under the leadership of uh, FIDI, during the conference in, uh, in April, uh, there was also all stakeholders got together uh, under the sustainability uh, topic, how to collaborate as in uh, all stakeholders of the industry, RMCs, associations. So as you just said, it's not uh, something like checklist yeah. to do. Yeah. It is a responsibility, like being, Absolutely. as you just said. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I actually want us to be quiet while we're doing it. I know that sounds weird me quiet because greenwashing is everywhere at the moment and i would love us to actually come up with a solution and provide the solution before we market the solution so let's actually do something you know deeds not words let's instead of like putting a picture of us up saying hey look at us aren't we amazing let's actually just talk within our industry and actually try and get this across the line in order that we've got one thing that we've moved forward with in sustainability that helps everybody eventually. I'm very sorry, I'm going to sort of interrupt the conversation at that point, be mindful of time. Um, we've just heard the word technology a couple of times. Daniel, how do you see technological advancements in the future taking a bit of part of your supply chain or the role that it will play? Yeah, I, I wish I knew. <laughs> um, Disappointing? Yeah, <laughs> I, can, I can give some opinions perhaps, but um, I think it's fair to say, especially from the RMC standpoint, that we uh, operate extremely complex supply chain, um, which makes things a bit, bit more difficult for us. Uh, to previous point, um, sometimes it's the suppliers that actually drive the change. Yeah. You would expect that the big RMCs can actually make change, but it's, the, it's a big ship to turn. They have to do it first, yeah. um, so we are looking for ideas. Um, there's plenty of ideas. We also have to process the ideas, evaluate the ideas. So, uh, many times we do rely on uh, much smaller companies to come and help us, just, just to say that. Hey, we'll be there for you. Yeah. Um, obviously, in the tech, uh, tech space, uh, digitization will continue, uh, for sure. There's, uh, there's so much happening. We've um, had a several projects with our cli clients, as an example, where um, they finally allow us to actually provide the feedback and uh, content for their websites, uh, landing pages, um, when they bring a big population to Londons and Dublins and... Um, high volume locations, which is fantastic. This wasn't the case before. Um, so we're seeing uh, being invited, you know, to these small, uh, small projects and being able to provide and refresh the content uh, frequently that is passed on to business managers and uh, recruiters and obviously even candidates in some cases, which is great to see. Um, data integration, some of the, some of the things that it's been on for many, many years now, we're still our challenge with um, GDPR, EU, US data privacy laws, um, what I'm heading with this is basically um, many, of our, many of our clients and, and employees are complaining about information not being passed from supplier to supplier. We're trying to figure out the best way where we equip the consultant to be able to actually um, legally pass the information uh, so we don't have to ask these questions or employee doesn't have to ask the question or respond to, uh, to the question 25 times during the process. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's quite important to, to get it sorted out if we can, um, obviously within compliance of the GDPR, EU, US data privacy laws. Um, flexible service offering is something that, um, again, has been on and discussed uh, for quite some time. Um, our clients are coming to us asking for one thing. Um, give, us, give us a story supported by the data. Let the data uh, or data tell the story, which is quite interesting. So we, we are going to our suppliers are getting, and challenging them on uh, not only providing excellent service, but uh, can we get some metrics around that? As I mentioned earlier, around the uh, milestones, for example. So we are monitoring the um, number of property viewings uh, in some markets and being able to actually um, aggregate information and be able to tell a story to the client and basically say your two-day or three-day service is not sufficient uh, going back to is the program fit for purpose um, things in the temporary housing space for example lead time report again uh, critical to understand how much time are we giving our suppliers uh, to source temporary housing um, so there's a bunch of initiatives that are uh, that are on we haven't reached out to entire supply chain to you know to get this done but i think uh, we'll be seeing more and more uh, asking for more data, more meaningful interpretation of data that our clients uh, are requesting. Um, 
self-service, uh, again, uh, business to customer uh, products, uh, very popular. Uh, we can't forget about the lump summers and people that have money and don't know what to do with it when they come to a uh, host location. So uh, I know every company is trying to find a silver bullet solution um, and the products are out there, but uh, there isn't a proper global solution, you know, quite there yet. Uh, I think we're getting closer, uh, but it's going to be, uh, I think, a game changer um, in the future. Um, last but not least, and probably the least favorite point, but I'm going to mention it anyway, uh, is basically integrated bidding platforms. So, as you know, in a house of good space or temporary housing space, um, this is already in place where um, suppliers essentially bid um, for the jobs to be able to provide a service. Uh, we are seeing some attempts uh, you know, for this to come to DSP space and some other service categories. It's going to be a bit more complicated, but there's still, for some clients, um, that procurement mindset of, we need to be able to essentially give opportunities in a bidding platform for all these services. Uh, not something I'm, I'm particularly fond of, but uh, uh, it is definitely out there. It's something to, uh, something to watch for. Thanks, Daniel. For the next couple questions, just because we're a little bit behind on our timing, if we could. Um, arguably, with technology, DEI is another big hot topic. Um, Anna, can you tell us a little bit how about you would any recommendations or how it's implemented in supply chain? So not only in the talent acquisition, but on the supply chain side. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's an imperative for most, you know, large organisations these days to ensure they've got. DE and I incorporated into their supply chain and to have sight of that supply chain. Um, and so, I mean, I'm sure that's what you guys are doing <laughs> all the time. Um, so, but, you know, have encouraging new suppliers to come into the market. Like I was really encouraged today in the starting session to see how many first timers stood up. I think that was fantastic to see so many um, new newcomers on the block as it were um, and they will you know help us to unlock innovation and create value and competition and also allow us to enter new markets um, I frequently am doing stuff in very far-flung places of the Pacific um, and uh, and so and and also when we do do stuff in those places like we actually are creating a real socio-economic impact in those local communities, and that's really important to, you know, um, sort of come right down through the supply chain. Um, and I think uh, Euro plays a really pivotal role in that, actually, because as we get more and more people in there, we want to, like I was saying before, we want to be able to bring them up and, and along with us. And I'm not saying a 100-page data security questionnaire is anyone's favorite thing to do, but if we can all learn how to do that, if there's a willingness, I guess, if you can't be compliant and you're not willing to be compliant, there's not really going to be a space for you, I don't think, in the future. But if you do have willingness to, to get on board, then, you know, Euro is a fantastic fantastic platform to help facilitate that. If we grab onto um, the socio-economic impact that you've just spoken of and the concept of not leaving anybody behind and being inclusive, um, Ibru, how would you consider the relevance of that in quality and basically your supply chain? It sounds definitely collaborative and inclusive, but in terms of quality, I see it's very risky. Uh, I've, been, I, I've served at the FIDI board for the past nine years and I had the privilege to work on the FIDI's mandatory quality program uh, called FAME. And what I learned throughout those years is if you say that we don't leave anyone behind, it may end up being like we compromise quality not to leave anyone behind. Uh, so I believe that we have a responsibility to assure that our supply chain is uh, quality and uh, for that, there needs to be a minimum uh, standard for the industry, supported by mandatory uh, trainings and uh, random audits. Uh, of course, we don't want to leave anyone behind. After all, it's also time-wise and cost-wise uh, much more complicated to implement a new, new one, replace with a new one, uh, but also uh, it's also up to the other party to comply with it. Yeah, thanks. We do have a final question. It's actually the biggest question of the session. 
I'm quite interested to hear what the answer is. Um, how do you, Renee, ever think we will find solutions if what we love to do most is rely on the government to sort out our problems? That is a big question, but <laughs> um, I guess there's actually some real practical examples. We've all um, been through COVID, and I'll just give you an example. In South Africa, um, we actually couldn't manufacture our own masks and PPE equipment. Um, and there was a group called B4SA, which all got together, and it was a consortium of civil society who volunteered time. I was one of those, because I didn't think I'd be in global mobility with um, the lockdown. Um, and we got um, private business uh, and government involved, all to basically look at manufacturers who are manufacturing cream, um, uh, medical um, PPE, and they converted it and got it all um, through SAPRA, which is the approval body for uh, the regulation around what they needed to produce. And they pivoted manufacturers um, in a very radically collaborative way so that South Africa would not rely on um, importing that equipment. So we have real examples like that. Um, I think another real example um, is actually in our own space, and Anna and I haven't really touched on DSP or immigration or anything particularly. Um, but in immigration, for example, I mean, in South Africa, again, we have a huge problem at the moment. South Africa's changed their regulations um, that all immigration can now only be, you submit your paperwork outside the country and all your processing will happen in Pretoria, in Pretoria um, near Johannesburg. The problem with that is they didn't upstaff or upskill, and so there are like eight to nine months delays. Um, and what we really need is we need companies, civil society, um, everybody to get involved and actually lobby government to be able to make those changes so we can, um, you know, get business back and because we rely heavily on foreign direct investment in South Africa. But Anna, and there was another example in Australia where yeah. Mike... So if anybody uses Trello, Trello's parent company is Atlassian. They were, um, Mike Cannon Brooks is the CEO of Atlassian and they're an Australian, well, originally Australian business. And he's um, just been listed as Times, one of Times top 100 most influential people in the world. And he's basically fed up with how long it's taking the government to get on with um, shifting the climate agenda in Australia. And so he, I mean, he's like a billionaire. He just made a takeover bid for AGL which is one of our largest um, utility providers, burns a lot of coal. And uh, the bid was failed, but he's now a majority stakeholder. Um, and so he's got a seat at the table, basically, and he's affecting change pretty quickly. And uh, as of Monday, the chairman is gone, the CEO is gone. So, you know, it just goes to show what can happen when you actually put your money where your mouth is and, and take action. It's really, really amazing. And, I mean, not that I know exactly Elon Musk's motivation fully, but the purchase of Twitter, um, he, my understanding is that he wants to have an open um, social media communication and he doesn't believe it can be done any other way unless someone from a private um, perspective owns that. And I think the, the reality is that, you know, we need advocates to be standing up and shouting from, you know, um, like the Greater Thundenbergs to really sort of say what the problems are um, so that government can start making changes, policy, but that is slow. We also need businesses to get involved and encourage government to make those changes. But as we can see, we can't rely and wait around for governments to make change because um, we certainly know that um, they didn't do, you know, make the changes on their own with COVID. We all had to pull together, every single one of us. So it's a really um, collaborative um, affair. Yeah. Thank you. Our intent of what we were doing here today was to just install not only a sense of hope, but just a little bit of inspiration to have a transparent conversation, to start the conversations on collaboration. We'd love it to be radical, but if you start out soft, that's also great. Um, we're really grateful to two of these leading ladies, sorry, Daniel, um, Anna and Renee, for putting this together, putting this forward for Eura. And just as a closing note, we'd just like you to remember that every day that we wake up, we make a difference. And it is up to us what difference we are going to make on the respective day. Thank you.